All right, we're going to get started. Good evening and welcome to the Grand Rounds. Uh, today is a special day because um, uh, we have uh, a very important lecture on a topic um, which has something in common in terms of my research interest and my careers as well. And this is related to pericardial disease. And to give the talk is none other than uh, one of the big uh, person who has contributed enormously in the uh, research in this area, um, Dr. Alan Klein. But before we introduce him, uh, I'm just going to go through some of the logistics. So, so this particular uh, lecture uh, received uh, a lot of attention and uh, I think we're gonna have a lot of people joining online as well. Initially, we wanted to just do it um, in person, but there was a big request for making it a hybrid. So we will have also an online presence and I'm seeing many people are joining uh, from other campuses as well. Uh, for this uh, particular, uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, if you are interested to get the CME credit, uh, please text 20394 to the number 888-816-4893. And I'm, I'm seeing like a lot of you are trying to take a scan, a digital scan, you can do that. Uh, and if you don't have a cloud CME profile, you can make one. And the CME office has uh, notified us that in the event you're encountering any difficulties, do not worry. Uh, they have been experiencing some um, difficulties in the registration, but they will uh, get it all sorted out. So please connect back to us if you have any difficulties in registering. For physicians, uh, you will have an ability to get also an MOC point. And for that, you'll have to follow the CME credit and use the room code FUTURE62 and this link uh, will be circulated subsequently as well. And uh, the link is available and the CME credit and MOC credits are all available up to 12 hours after the, uh, the lecture has been recorded. And this is going to be made available online as well. So with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Professor Alan Klein. Uh, Dr. Alan Klein is the Director of Center of Diagnosis and Treatment for Pericardial Diseases at the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at the um, Siddle and Arnold Miller Family Heart Vascular and Thoracic Institute at Cleveland Clinic. And uh, one of the great uh, things about the Grand Rounds is you need to request the CV and I typically do print out. And CV was, uh, it kept on, my, and my papers ran out. And in fact, I had to go down for asking for more papers. So it, it was this big. Uh, close to about 180 plus pages, uh, and I went through them, and it's impossible to characterize his uh, uh, all the wonderful work that he has done, but I would certainly highlight a few points uh, which are of interest. Uh, Dr. Klein uh, comes from Canada. His uh, initial uh, residency and internship was at McGill University. Subsequently, he went to uh, University of Ottawa for the cardiology fellowship, and had an interest in non-invasive cardiology. Today, we had an understanding of how he came to Mayo Clinic, uh, where he had an ability to work with uh, some of the legends um, in, in echocardiography, Liv Hartley, and of course, his mentor, Dr. Tajik, um, uh, uh, really funneled him into the field of non-invasive uh, imaging. And uh, after his completion of his uh, fellowship and training, he went to Cleveland Clinic and established several areas of important uh, investigative uh, uh, fields uh, in cardiology. Uh, his interests have, uh, have broadly gone over many aspects of cardiology from imaging, echocardiography, uh, multimodality imaging to specific diseases, valvular heart diseases, atrial fibrillation, diastology, and of course, pericard pericardial uh, diseases. And in these areas, not only he has contributed enormously to the literature but also he has been uh, uh, important in, in his uh, role as uh, a PI. And very rarely do you have an imager or an echocardiography um, specialist who has been a PI of uh, a multi-center uh, randomized trials, um, specifically in the areas of atrial fibrillation, uh, diastology, and now, of course, in pericardial diseases. Um, he has uh, contributed to over 400 uh, publication, peer-reviewed publications, and many important areas, uh, NEGM Lancet, his uh, Rhapsody trial uh, was recently uh, published in NEGM in 2021. 
Uh, he has over 55 textbook chapters and over 500 abstracts, and he has mentored uh, thousands and many people worldwide. Specifically, his mentorship goes beyond uh, national, international, in the national, international cir circulation because of his uh, work at American Society of Echocardiography, ACC, National Board of Echocardiography, his work in, with the journals. And um, he had uh, uh, he was the uh, president of the American Society of Echocardiography in 2016, and uh, uh, in 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 the uh, some important awards and recognition that he has had since then. I just identified a few of them, many uh, which include the Adler Lectures, ESC Lifetime Achievement uh, Award, Cleveland Clinic's Professor um, Recognition for Life uh, Lifetime Achievement Award, and he has been also recognized as top. Uh, 100,000 scientists in the world. Um, he has, uh, a, he continues to be very prolific in his, uh, uh, in his uh, uh, education as a, as a clinician, educator, uh, and a mentor. He, he has impacted lives of many people, certainly me, I have interacted many times, and his uh, humility and his approach to medicine is something worth extreme emulation. Um, he's directed several symposium. I'm looking forward to his symposium in Miami, which I'm going to be able to attend. Uh, and uh, but most importantly, it's fun. It's been fun to work with him. So with that, uh, I'm bringing over uh, one of the legends in cardiology, uh, Dr. Alan Klein, and he's going to talk to us on recurrent pericarditis, new advances in imaging and anti ILT one agents. Uh, thanks, Partho. Um, can you hear me? So um, it's a great pleasure being here in uh, Rutgers, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Hospital. Um, Partho gave me a re very nice introduction, but I told the fellows there's one thing he didn't mention is that I, I'm an avid ice hockey player. So if you, uh, if you talk about the New York Rangers or the New Jersey Devils, I can get into a good conversation. Actually, uh, I have a game this week that I have to get back to. Uh, so in terms of this topic, there's a a real um, evolution or revolution in the field. Uh, in this picture, you can see um, on your left is an MRI, uh, delayed enhancement on the right, as you can see, the molecule uh, Rolanicep. And we think of this co concept of recurrent pericarditis as really imaging guided therapy, an MRI and perhaps advanced echo to guide the therapy. So these are my disclosures. And Partho mentioned that uh, it's very cold in New Jersey today, uh, but um, in March uh, next month uh, in the Fontainebleau Miami Beach Hotel, we are doing a uh, my 26th year symposium uh, on valve disease structural and diastology, capillary diastology imaging summit. So uh, Partho is going to be talking about AI and uh, some uh, other aspects, but uh, do join us if you can get down in New Jersey. Um, in the next 45 minutes, I'd like to give a general introduction about the field, uh, talk about some of the pathology, what are the syndromes, uh, the role of multimodality imaging, show some quick cases, and uh, what we mean by imaging guided therapy. So you know you made it if you uh, get on the news, so I was very fortunate. Um, uh, there is a, um, every Saturday on MSNBC, there's Yasmin Bozugian. She herself had pericarditis, and she wanted to give back. So she uh, she called me, and uh, we had a um, we had a um, a, um, a session on MSNBC. Now I asked her um, when it's going to be broadcast, and she says uh, uh, this uh, this is in July. I taped in July. She said probably this weekend. Uh, someone in the politics, unless Trump gets indicted. So he gets, he keeps on getting in debt. I get pushed back. So they finally put it on Labor Day during football. So it, it wasn't well, well noted, but we were on um, on MSNBC, um, a nice session with uh, uh, Martin LeWinter from uh, Vermont. So we had a nice session. Anybody recognize who this is? Who follows uh, women's basketball? Uh, anybody? Dawn Staley. Uh, she's a, one of my patients, public knowledge. She had pericarditis. Um, and she uh, uh, talked to me session. Also, um, okay, uh, what is Rhapsody? Rhapsody, is that is that Bohemian Rhapsody? Is this uh, a Queen concert? This is Rhapsody from uh, New England Journal of Medicine. This is uh, our phase three 
trial I-1 trap for lanoseptin and recurrent pericarditis. So we're very fortunate to uh, publish the Rhapsody trial. Uh, and in this field, there's been basically an explosion of publications. So somebody asked me uh, from the fellows, uh, do we have to, um, is it rheumatology that prescribes uh, these biologics or cardiology? I think cardiology will have to know uh, about anakinra, rolanosep. Uh, and here's an explosion of publications. So if you write a review on the top, it would definitely get accepted in a good journal. And then we had something in JAMA cardiology in the last year. So a lot of interest in the I-1 blockers. Um, so what you really need to know is uh, differences between anakinra, which is a recombinant IL-1 receptor antagonist, uh, rolanosep, which is an IL-1 alpha and beta trap, and even canakinabab, which is a human monoclonal antibody for IL-1 beta. Uh, and more recently, uh, there's a, a Russian study. Um, I'm not sure why they named it this, goflicosep. It sounds like something else, but... Um, uh, and this is published in, uh, in uh, Jack, and we uh, were fortunate to write the editorial. So this is the uh, third player. Um, actually, we were involved a little bit with the trial, but uh, after the, uh, the war broke out with Ukraine, the uh, Cleveland Clinic lawyer says, cease and desist because there's a, um, a ban, you know, anything with Russia. So, um, so we didn't were really involved with the trial, but we did write the editorial about the, uh, the agent. Okay, so here's the pericardium. So this is a graphic showing the the sac around the heart, uh, and there's many diseases that can affect the um, the pericardium. And my colleague Paul Kramer was actually moved to uh, Northwestern. We wrote a nice review about uh, complicated pericarditis, understanding what are the risk factors and what's the path to physiology uh, to inform imaging and treatment. And then we also got into this area of how does imaging uh, help you uh, with pericardial diseases? So if you have somebody at Robert Wood Johnson Hospital that uh, has pericarditis, we see where you are, are you on the spectrum? Are you in the, um, is there ongoing inflammation? Uh, or is there constrictive physiology? So do you have acute pericarditis, recurrent, chronic, or burnt out? Uh, for the constriction part, are you transient, subacute, uh, chronic, or calcific? And what does the advanced imaging show? For example, MRI will show uh, edema and delayed enhancement early on, and then gradually that will disappear over time. And based on that, you decide what type of therapy. Is it triple therapy, biologics, uh, or, or surgery? So that's the, the concept. When I see somebody, I, I ask, you know, where are they in the, um, in the spectrum of the pericarditis? So we're talking briefly about the multimodality imaging. So this is an MRI, uh, and it's really an important imaging biomarker. And Partho and I were talking earlier about, you know, perhaps echo, perhaps with uh, a better imaging, you can per, uh, perhaps see inflammation. But here you see the edema and the inflammation. So from this picture, you could predict how long it's going to take. So we tell patients uh, this is very uh, significant uh, active pericarditis. This would take three to five years to get up all the medicine. Could be, you know, could be less, could be more, but this is how long... Um, uh, the, uh, the this will take just based on this image. So this was a 17-year-old boy uh, from Columbus, Ohio, with rip roaring uh, recurrent pericarditis. Also, you have to uh, examine patients. So uh, I heard there's a lot of you know service you have to do, a lot of clinical examination. So these were two patients that we saw. This guy was from Mexico City, and he went to New York City and picked up a virus. And his leg started to swell in Mexico, and they were just giving him uh, diuretics. And this guy was from upstate New York with an SVT ablation. Anybody from EP going into EP in the group? Anybody? No. Uh, somebody usually puts up their hand. I say, you're my best business. But SVT ablation, uh, gone bad. And uh, you can see they both developed constriction. Uh, and neither of them, neither of the clinician looked at the JVD. So you really have to examine the patients. This patient was treated medically with anti-inflammatories, never needed surgery, and this patient needed surgery. So very important to examine the patients. Any fellows in the audience? Any fellows? Or, uh, so uh, how would you examine this patient? What, what angle would you want to see the, uh, the JVD? 45 degrees? or uh, Actually, you would have to almost make them stand or sit because they'll be so high 
that you won't see the top of the column. So very important to, to examine the patient. So this is where I work. I work at Cleveland Clinic, uh, Heart and Vascular Thoracic Institute. And uh, we have a pericarditis guy, but my, my friends, my colleagues make fun of me. They call me a, uh, a skin doctor, dermatologist of the heart. So I say, that's very important. It's very lucrative. You can take things out, you can inject things. So I'm the dermatologist of the heart. And when I was president of the American Society of ECA, I wrote a, you have to write presence page every month. So I did something called Dermatology of the Heart, Tales from the Pericardial Sac. So these are some of the, uh, the stories or cases that we see. Um, but as Parthro knows and, the, uh, and Camus knows that we get no respect in this field. Now you're into Taver, you're into Tear, you're into uh, Tricuspid Clips, you're into uh, Tendines and uh, you name it. But in this field, when we were writing the guidelines, um, uh, they said meet in this room, but they couldn't even spell it right. They called it ASC periodical diseases. So even to this day, I'm fighting with ACC to get a guideline going um, with uh, pericardial disease. Uh, but we did manage to write, actually 10 years ago, we uh, did a guideline on multimodality imaging of pericardium. Uh, Europeans uh, did the same thing the year later. And our guidelines were translated into uh, to Chinese. Um, I think that says pericarditis, but I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but we use the European guidelines uh, from 2015 uh, to, to guide us uh, currently. And um, so how do we get our patients at Cleveland? So basically, <clears throat> um, we have this hub and spoke model where patients come um, for one to two days. Uh, they see different, um, they see the cardiologists, they see the subspecialties. Uh, you collect analysis of bloods and fluids, advanced imaging, there's research projects, clinical trials. Uh, if they need a cath, if they need to see a surgeon. So that's our one-stop shopping. And I, I understand you have the uh, Hokum and Amyloid Centers here, uh, here in uh, New Brunswick. But a lot of our referrals are from uh, social media, from Facebook. Uh, there's over, I think, 7,000 members now uh, on the pericarditis uh, page that talk about uh, their drugs. And, um, and there's also a foundation that I was involved with uh, called the Pericarditis Alliance, similar to myocarditis or uh, Hokum amyloid. <laughs> so there is a group out there uh, for these patients. Let's talk about pathology. So uh, here's an example. This is from our guidelines showing a uh, specimen of the, uh, of, a, um, of the heart. You can see there's a lot of fat around the heart. Uh, the pericardial uh, attachments uh, going up to the gray vessels. And then when you remove the uh, outer layer, you see that there's a lot of um, epicardial fat. So uh, for the fellows, you want to make sure anteriorly you don't call pericardial effusion. It's usually fat or a fat pad uh, anterior to the RV. So these are the layers. It's almost like an onion, uh, the pericardium. So starting with the uh, inner lining, you have, uh, you have endocardium, you have myocardium. Then you get a list layer of fat, epicardial fat. Uh, then you get the visceral layer of the pericardium. Here's the potential space, around 50 cc's or less of fluid. And then you have the parietal layer, the fibrous layer, and then you get another layer of fat, epipericardial fat. So almost like an onion um, in, in for the pericardium. Uh, in terms of the gross pathology, so these are three different cases. One's uremia, where you get a fibrinous pericarditis. On the other extreme, you have some of the radiation, like uh, from Hodgkin's disease, radiation, sort of burnt out. And in between, from, uh, from uh, neoplastic disease, you get bleeding it to the fibrin. Now, interestingly, A and B is when the gadolinium gets into the pericardial space, but not, not, the, uh, not the radiation case. So one of our fellows had a good idea, says uh, Dr. Klein. So if you send somebody to surgery with um, a late enhancement, what does the, the path show? So we did that study, and basically what you're finding is that if you stain for CD34, uh, it shows the new blood vessels. So basically, you're growing new blood vessels, neovascularization with an active pericarditis. And as the delay enhancement disappears, uh, you get more organized fibrous pericarditis with no neovascularization. So basically, the uh, GAD is getting into the neovascular space. There's capillary leak, and um, this is a, a very useful tool but this is the uh, pathology for this pericarditis. What are the syndromes? 
what syndrome? So very easy in the pericardial space is that you have acute and recurrent pericarditis. Uh, effusion tamponade, you can see somebody with that, with tamponade uh, over here. Um, I say even a fellow could tap this, right? Um, then you have constriction and then effusive constriction. And then you have mass that this is a case of lymphoma and then congenital anomalies. So this is the, um, the shopping list of uh, po possible clinical syndromes. Uh, very important for definitions. So if you're doing clinical trials, you have to define it, right? So uh, acute means that uh, the event lasts four to six weeks, perhaps up to three months. Incessant means that it's basically nonstop symptoms without remission for three months. Uh, recurrent means that you get better and then you get worse after four to six weeks and then chronic more than three months. So this is uh, how you define uh, pericarditis. Uh, to make the diagnosis, uh, you need two or four clinical criteria. So everybody knows these criteria, but it's not so easy because a lot of people um, go on the internet and they, they read or they go on the Facebook and they, they come and they got some sharp pains, hurts when you lie back, uh, better when sitting up. But a lot of pain is uh, atypical, um, especially in the COVID era. Uh, you're supposed to find a rub, but rubs are very hard to hear. So I said, who heard the rub? They said in the ER, uh, my primary doctor. I said, that, uh, it's very hard to hear rub. I'm not so sure about that. EKG, we uh, look for the ST elevation, PR depression, but a young person may have physiologic ST elevation. So you have to be careful with that. And as I mentioned, uh, the effusion, people mix up the fat with the fusion. So you can have somebody on steroids that claim they have pericarditis. Uh, then you go more objectively to a CRP set rate, and then you have, let's say, MRR or CT. So it is a confusing area. A third of our patients, we have an abstract at ACC uh, saying that of our referrals in the last two, three years, a third of the patients referred for pericarditis don't have pericarditis. They got chest pain, but, um, and the COVID era and the vaccine era has really changed the, the practice. So we're trying to uh, tease out uh, some of this information. Uh, what's the epidemiology? It's not very common, but um, acute pericarditis is the most common disease of the pericardium. Uh, most cases are self-limiting, but roughly, uh, based on European data, roughly 27.7 uh, cases per 100,000. So it's not that common. Roughly 5% of ER emissions for chest pain uh, and 0.2 of uh, hospital in hospital emissions. And recurrent pericarditis, once you get the acute episode, a third uh, will have recurrence. And roughly they estimate, this is for the FDA, they estimate roughly as an orphan disease, 40,000 patients have this, and 14,000 have uh, two more recurrences. So who comes to uh, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Hospital or Cleveland Clinic? Basically, you have acute pericarditis, they get seen in the ER, and most resolve, you never hear from them. But cardiologists uh, will see roughly 15% uh, will get myocardial involvement. Roughly a, a couple percent will go into tamponade right from, um, from the get-go. But what we're interested in is this complicated pericarditis. Roughly a third will have recurrence, and 6% will be multiple recurrences. And then there'll be a few that have transient constriction, and then a few will go into chronic um, constricted pericarditis. So I showed you this basketball player. So this is a, uh, a famous basketball player. Um, as you can see, I like my sports. This, uh, this, um, this uh, woman um, uh, coaches the University of South Carolina Gamecocks. And that's a, a, um, basically the top basketball program for women in the country. She's a five-time Olympian. She went to the Rio Olympics and picked up a virus in Rio de Janeiro, and then she came back to South Carolina, and nobody could really diagnose what's going on. And being an Olympian, you like to exercise, and exercise is actually the worst thing. So trying to tell uh, this patient to, you know, to uh, cool it and calm down and basically take some of the medicines that we prescribe. So she, uh, she was on, on with me at MSNBC and uh, has an interesting story to tell. And I, I said, tell her, I said, I see you on TV. You're supposed to, you know, relax. You're running down yelling at the players. Uh, let your assistant coaches um, 
coach the players, but she uh, she had um, an active recurrent pericarditis. So who's going to get this complicated disease? So if you go to the ER and they give you steroids, that's a bad thing, or you don't give colchicine. On the other hand, if you don't respond to NSAIDs, uh, and uh, or have a, a very high CRP. Uh, those are some bad things that for um, complicated disease. I'm also thinking, as he's shown in the audience, we have it. We share a patient. Uh, there was a th third of the patients don't have this. So there's this patient from um, Alaska uh, that uh, makes her cringe. But uh, this gentleman was a uh, sort of a. Um, I think he did the Iditarod, you know, with the with the dogs and the, maybe a marathon. Uh, uh, cross country skier, but he claimed he had uh, pericarditis. And uh, he uh, went to Mayo. He came to Cleveland. He saw the imagers. He saw heart failure. And you know what? I think uh, the last I heard, believe it or not, he had surgery. Somebody did surgery in, uh, in Denver. And now he's calling me. He's still having trouble. So I said, go to the Mayo Clinic, go to Choney in, uh, in New Jersey. Uh, but anyways, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of these patients out there. But the most common causes uh, <clears throat> of pericarditis are the viral idiopathic. So if you get uh, the flu, uh, get COVID, uh, you can get this. Uh, if you go to the um, developing countries, TB would be the most common. Um, in the U.S., I would say uh, increasingly is post-cardiac injury. So this means if you have uh, surgery, let's say at Cleveland Clinic, um, if you have um, an EP, um, you got AFib ablation. Uh, even after MI, you can get this um, uh, post-cardiac injury. Uh, autoimmune, you want to separate that. This is auto-inflammatory, what we are looking at, but autoimmune lupus, um, rheumatoid, and uh, neoplastic disease. But uh, by far, idiopathic viral post-cardiac injury would be the most common. So who thought it was going to be this complicated? But basically, we look at the stages, acute, uh, first recurrence, multiple recurrence, steroid-dependent colchicine resistant or constriction. And then when do you do imaging? When do you do the echo? When do you do the CMR? Uh, when do you do CT? And what are the treatments? Um, NSAIDs colchicine early on and for first recurrence a little bit longer. When do you go with steroid sparing? When do you consider pericardiectomy? So this is how we uh, look at our patients with, with pericarditis. Uh, those of you going into multimodality, imaging is very important in this field. You can see um, cases of MRI, uh, septal bounce, um, calcium around the heart and CT. You can see abnormal strain uh, uh, on echo. Uh, so very useful for these type patients. Um, Echo is always the first line. Actually, clinical exam is the first line, and then you do the echo, <clears throat> and then you can consider CAT or MRI. Um, second line, uh, you do those other tests when you have a bad echo, um, when you're looking for inflammation or calcium, or if they had a previous open heart surgery. So this is an article we wrote back over 10 years ago, but the the pros and the cons of multimodality. So echo is always first line, slow cost. You can do it even with handheld echo. Um, and you have the disadvantages if you're, if you're obese, uh, tough windows. Uh, CT is very good looking for calcium, pre-op planning, but you are getting radiated. MRI is very good for tissue characterization, but you try to tell in a, uh, an obese patient that's claustrophobic, with a pacemaker with renal insufficiency to get into a closed end scanner is very, very difficult. So uh, these are some of the issues. You could throw in a PET scanning. I know you're getting involved with PET scanning. So um, sometimes the FTG uh, gets um, taken up by the pericardium as well. So in terms of our protocols, um, if you have acute pericarditis, uh, you can do echo and or CMR, and you try to decide whether it's constrictive physiology present or absent and try to plan uh, where they sit in that spectrum of pericarditis based on the MRI and the echo. Okay, so here's a, um, here's a uh, patient. She's a 23-year-old uh, from uh, New York City. Uh, she wants to go to vet school, and she has this phenotype. Her, I can tell you her CRP and SED rate are a little bit elevated. She's already an N-state in colchicine, and this is her MRI. 
So first of all, it's a pretty stellar MRI. You can see very clearly, everything's white. Uh, the fat is suppressed. Uh, she has edema and she has severe uh, pericardial inflammation. So I'm very nervous about this patient. She's gonna do uh, her veterinary studies in the islands, I think uh, Grenada. Uh, and um, I'm a little concerned how she's gonna do. Uh, so I thought that the, um, she's failing the standard of care. So I said, you probably need to go on uh, biologics, Rolanosep. Um, so this is, um, this is how we use this, but knowing from my, um, um, from our studies, it may take up to three to five years uh, to heal. So here's a, a, a male physician uh, that got uh, paragraphs from the COVID booster. And uh, he's failing his standard of care. Uh, he has ST elevation, a fusion with a septal bounce, uh, Doppler variation, uh, some annulus reverses. His MRI is very, very positive. Uh, he went also on biologics and uh, he's getting better. He avoided steroids. So what we did do now is that we met them to the hospital, uh, put them on uh, anakinra, which is a short acting uh, biologic, and then transition them over to uh, Rolanosep. So that would be the, and then they avoid the, uh, the steroids. Then we wean off the NSAID and colchicine and he's done quite well. Uh, <clears throat> Who gets admitted to the hospital? Who's very, very sick? Who are you worried about? If they have fever, a subacute onset, uh, they're immunosuppressed, uh, somebody got hit in the chest, uh, they're on blood thinners, they have mild pericarditis, uh, effusion and tamponade, and even the MRI would be a good reason to, um, to get them uh, admitted and sort of calm things down and get them on the proper therapy. Uh, how do you treat? Well, this is from the European guidelines. Um, acute recurrent or similar, but um, aspirin, ibuprofen, and cochicine. <clears throat> For the fellows, who goes on aspirin versus ibuprofen? Any other fellows who want to comment? What do you put on uh, aspirin? So basically, CAD a little bit older um, versus ibuprofen. So that would be a, uh, a standard of care. Cochicine, note, it should be... Um, up to three months. So the biggest mistake is that you don't, uh, you under treat. The biggest cause of recurrence is basically you, you're uh, giving them one week of medicines and, they, and then they recur. Uh, recur to the same meds, but uh, longer uh, therapy. Look, colchicine up to six months. Um, as you know, colchicine has also been used now for uh, prevention of uh, CAD. So um, it's a different dose. <clears throat> So in terms of management, uh, you have first line, second therapy. So, <clears throat> so for acute pericarditis, uh, it's the dual therapy plus exercise restriction. So no exercise restriction. That's the biggest fight in the office is that uh, you get a younger person that wants to exercise. And we say you got to cool the exercise uh, because exercise could um, aggravate the pericarditis. Uh, second line traditionally has been low dose steroids. Uh, if you get recurrent pericarditis, third line would be the uh, the biologics or IVIG uh, Imuran or fourth line pericardectomy. Now, as I mentioned at the end, this is all changing. There's a paradigm shift that we're giving the biologics a lot earlier, earlier than the, than the steroids. So, for in terms of basic science. Um, we think of this as an auto-inflammatory disease. So for example, uh, I'm gonna pick on electrophysiology game. Uh, somebody comes to Robert Wood Johnson and goes for an AFib, a, a, a VT ablation. So you're putting the catheter right into the, uh, to the pericardial space. You cause pericardial damage. Um, you have uh, these uh, PAMPs and DAMPs um, and you injure your pericardial cell. Uh, simplistically, um, you release IO1 alpha into the circulation. Macrophages are attracted. Uh, the alpha attaches to the uh, macrophage. Uh, there's activation of the um, caspase system, um, and you, you convert the pro beta to active beta, IO1 beta. The alpha and beta attach to the capillaries. You get capillary leak and you cause pericardial inflammation. And then this is a repetitive cycle. Uh, the beta stimulates IL-6, and you get elevated CRP, and the COX uh, causes fever. So if you had an agent that blocks IL-1 alpha and beta, either traps it or blocks it, uh, this may be good for, for this disease. 
So another diagram showing how the drugs work. You have anakinra, which is a uh, recombinant IL-1 uh, alpha and beta blocker. Uh, Rolanosap, which traps IL-1 alpha and beta. Uh, here you have colchicine, uh, affects the microtubules. Uh, so these are, this is, uh, every week I get a call from pharma that they have a new uh, drug that uh, affects the, um, the uh, signaling of the inflammasome. So there's other drugs that are, are in the pipeline, um, but pericarditis is a good model to, uh, to study this. Uh, <clears throat> the first trial was the uh, air trip trial from Italy. And these trials are not that many patients. You look at some of the big trials, you know, it's 10,000 patients. These are like, this is 21 patients. Uh, where anakinra uh, was very useful showing compared to placebo that it lowered the number of uh, relapses uh, compared to placebo. So this is the basis, often uh, done actually initially in uh, children. So um, anakinra is a short-acting medicine. It's not FDA approved. Um, it will never be FDA approved because the company uh, um, basically at, at, um, lost its patent and basically uh, it's off label. But we did a registry with the Italians showing that if you go in Anakinra, you have less recurrences, less ER emissions, and less hospitalizations. And you're more likely to get off on steroids. So it's a very short-acting uh, type drug. Uh, you have to give it daily and it seems to be very effective. So here's a case of a 68-year-old. Came to Cleveland, uh, he had pericarditis. Uh, and was treated with standard of care, triple therapy. He had tamponade. Eventually, we got him on anakinra. Did well. And then his insurance ran out. He had to stop the anakinra uh, cold turkey. And then his white cell count went up. His CRP went up. His rate went up. Comes back. He has constrictive physiology. He has some Doppler variation. Um, Okay, for the fellows, what do you see in your paddock vein? Uh, Dr. Sengupta smiling. Uh, he was involved with some of these uh, earlier uh, studies. What's the classic thing for constrictive physiology? What do you see in expiration? So you lose your, basically your, your diastolic flow uh, goes down and you get a big reversal. So this is quite classic for uh, constrictive physiology. It'll be on your echo boards, uh, uh, definitely. Uh, so this guy's MRI also, this is how he presented initially. Uh, Dima went away. LG got better, and then he stopped his anakin with cold turkey, and everything came back. So uh, this guy's very interesting because he turns out he has rheumatoid arthritis. He was given uh, uh, Rolanacep instead of anakin, and his rheumatoid got worse. And he's back on anakin now, so actually he's doing a little bit better. Uh, so he uh, he had recurrence because of the anakinra withdrawal and um, um, st restarted on anakinra, and he's done well. So rolanosep um, is a, a different type of molecule. It's basically a dimeric fusion protein. Um, here's the complexity of the molecule, but it basically traps or binds you know, one alpha and beta. So it's an old drug being around for the uh, CAP syndrome, which is a... Um, a inflammatory syndrome in children. We did the Rhapsody trial. So very simplistically, this was a, um, a double-blind uh, placebo-controlled withdrawal phase three trial. So we took patients with recurrent pericarditis, multiple recurrences that were on the standard of care. Um, and we the hypothesis was, does this trap reduce active episodes, decrease recurrence? The uh, Endpoint was time to pericarditis recurrence. So very simply, you uh, you were um, after screening, you were loaded with rolanosept, and then you had a run-in period. Uh, you were given blind rolanosept, and if you responded, and you weaned off your other medicines, then you were randomized one to one to placebo, and it was an event-driven trial. And then you also had a long-term extension. So in most clinical trials, you know, you may have a, uh, uh, you may be a 20% of reduction and you should call that positive. This was a 96% uh, risk reduction. So astronomically uh, successful. Uh, and basically um, in 61 patients that got randomized to uh, flare with Rolanosep versus 23. Um, and basically all the patients got off of their steroids 
And based on that, um, the FDA approved it very, very quickly. So it was approved in March of 21 uh, and uh, ready for commercial use. Uh, but the big question is how long do you have to give these medicines? And the bad news is that it comes back after um, uh, we did a long-term extension. This is in press now in, in Jaha that um, after 18 months, um, we gave the patient's choice to either stop it or, or continue. Uh, the ones that stopped it, 75% came back, only 3% um, uh, in the continual loss. Of, so we tell our patients at least two years. And, um, and then the question is, do you wean this? So we have an abstract at, at ACC about weaning versus stopping cold turkey or adding cold testing. But unfortunately, it does uh, the baseline MRI to me predicts how long it's going to take. And we know the MRI could take three to five years. So if you're talking about five to two and, two and five years uh, with these medicines. Uh, it's good for the company, but I'm saying not great for the patients. Here's a case of a gentleman from Chicago uh, with chronic recurrent pericarditis, uh, also on triple therapy, and had all the side effects of prednisone. I think he's big enough to play for the Chicago Bears. Um, but uh, you know he had the buffalo hump and the weight gain and memory loss. Uh, and here's his phenotype. You can see he has the um, uh, septal bounce, the late enhancement. And he was given um, uh, Rolanosept. And now he's over, uh, I think, now up to two years uh, with, this, with this therapy. And he weaned off with a prednisone. He's done quite well. And the question, when, when, when we stop this? And here's his base talking about... Um, Multimodality, look at the baseline MRI and look at his follow up. So I mentioned the FDA did approve uh, Rolanosept in uh, 31821. Uh, and, um, and getting back to that the new drug, so we did an editorial for Jack. So we have Anakinra, Rolanosept, and the Russian drug, Um So they're all almost identical. Uh, in terms of the Kaplan-Meier curves, right? Basically, versus placebo, um, uh, very, very important. So as I said, Rolanosept is FDA approved. This is um, uh, off-label and this is Russian. So I'm not sure where, where this is going to uh, uh, fit, but there are newer agents uh, being developed um, that uh, block the IL-1 uh, cascade. Uh, for briefly, uh, the differences between Anakinra and Rolanosept, basically, there's no load with Anakinra. It's roughly given 100 milligram, uh, milligram sub-Q daily. Uh, Rolando said there is a load, and you give it weekly. Um, duration, uh, in general, uh, you know, at least a year uh, or longer. And uh, you taper uh, anakinra. We're not sure how to stop Rolando said whether we uh, taper or stop cold turkey. The half-life for Rolando said is uh, a week. Uh, this is uh, hours. Okay, so those of you um, that like CBD, so we are doing a trial, uh, a trial called the uh, CBD. Uh, it's called the Maverick trial. So cannabidiol is a uh, small lipophilic, non-psychoactive uh, compound of uh, cannabis. Actually, we were going to name it the Happy Trial, but that didn't fly, so they named it the Maverick trial. So this is a animal model uh, from um, UVA and VCU saying that it uh, theoretically works in mice. Uh, and we're doing a pilot of over um, 20 patients and seems to be uh, quite effective. It's an oral solution uh, that we're testing with the FDA. So this is gonna be a pivotal trial coming up. We're finishing our pilot. So this is the, uh, the Maverick trial. So you'll probably see a late breaking trial maybe in a year or so on this. Okay, imaging eye therapy. So, those of you who do MRI, you have to do a very good MRI because a lot of the MRIs in the community don't necessarily look like this. Uh, they're all over the place. You know, everything's very bright. It's hard to say, especially in the COVID area where you're looking for minutia in the myocardium, the Lake Louise criteria. You're looking for MRIs, but they don't look like this. Um, there's a lot of fat. Everything looks bright. So this is quite, quite classic for, for pericarditis. Uh, so as I said, when we stage pericarditis with MRI, you look at whether it's active or, or is it burnt out. This you can treat with anti-inflammatories. This you often send for surgery. So here's an example of how long it takes. So you can see this patient was from Toronto, Canada. Um, so this patient has five years 
look at the MRIs gradually getting better, but it takes five years of, of medicine, uh, many recurrences, a lot of tapering. Uh, I'm pleased to report that um, uh, with uh, Jack Imaging, we are going to have a uh, article um, soon um, on the consensus uh, statement. Uh, right now, we're in front of the ACC to be a uh, basically a scientific statement, so we're uh, getting reviewed now for this. So this will be the latest from the U.S. side of um, about pericardium and uh, pericardial diseases. Uh, I could mention, um, I shouldn't mention, but the Europeans are working on something um, as well. Um, so that's uh, that's the latest in, on pericardial uh, consensus and, and guidelines. So here's our take home. If you want to uh, take a picture or a slide, but this is the um, when we have our patients with pericarditis, we ask the question: um, uh, Do you have recurrent or transient? And do you have an inflammatory phenotype? So what I mean is that your CRP is elevated, your MRI looks like this. Um, so those patients. We try to avoid the steroids. You're failing the standard of care. So you definitely should go into biologic uh, and avoid the steroids because your steroids are going to give for six months to a year, slow tapering. Uh, if you can get them uh, on the biologic, you wean off the other meds. And then the question is how long you'll be on the biologic. If somebody has pericardias, let's say an infusion in the past and you tap them and now they're coming, you don't find much. So there it's really empiric what you do. Um, you just give them low-dose steroids. You do a standard of care. Um, if you fail that, uh, the third line would be IVIG, um, Imuran, um, and fourth line pericardiectomy. Now, in our consensus, we had a fight with the male guys. Male does uh, very aggressive for pericardiectomy. So if you have somebody, so imagine you young guys in the audience, you have this for a few years, you're on biologics. Why not do pericardiectomy in a place similar to a valve surgery? Um, so valve, you do valve repair quite early for mitral valve. Um, if you have a center of excellence that has a low, uh, um, low mortality and expertise. So the same way, perhaps you can bypass all these drugs and go right to, uh, to pericardi radical pericardiectomy. And one of the, my colleagues from Northwestern is doing an article about pericardiectomy. So advocating, uh, early pericardiectomy. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, so I gave you a, a quick overview of the, of the field. I think there's a new renaissance in this um, sort of neglected area of um, where we don't get much respect. But I think now you have uh, a paradigm shift. You have the imaging, uh, whether echo, um, a few or echo looking at strain or uh, fluid. You got CT, you got MRI. Um, now those of you who do MRI, uh, maybe T1 mapping where you don't have to give any dye to pick up um, active pericarditis. Now we have the therapeutics. We have I1 blockers, uh, anakinra, relanosep, maybe goflicosep, perhaps uh, CBD um, in the future. So it's time to recognize uh, the paradigm shift in imaging and therapeutics. Now, I'd like to thank the audience, but my colleagues and patients um, in Cleveland. Uh, so I'd like to show one anecdote. To, so he allowed me to show his pictures. It's a young kid from Phoenix, Arizona. He came to see me and um, so he had uh, you know, recurrent pericarditis. So I should mention, I have a son who's a pediatric cardiologist. We both took care of him from the pediatric side and the adult side. So this uh, gentleman and the uh, kid and his uh, parents one opted for surgery. Uh, so he comes back and he comes back with this T-shirt. I survived my open heart. Now I, all I got is a stupid T-shirt. <laughs> then he comes back again uh, and he's playing baseball. So it helped him. And then he comes back more recently. Now he's taller than me and he's actively playing baseball in college. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Kamu and uh, Sasha, do you want to just, uh, Dr. Maganti and Dr. Sasha East to join for uh, a panel discussion? Uh, very tough topic. Uh, and a lot of people actually shy away from pericardial diseases because it's difficult to diagnose. So, would you like to start off with any comments or questions? I'm not sure if they have a microphone or not. Dr. Klein, that was so fantastic. Um, you know, just a couple of um, maybe questions and comments. 
one of the toughest patient population that I ever had to care for has been pericarditis, especially patients with lupus, patients with radiation heart disease. Um, no matter what we try with them, I just haven't had too much luck. The second is all of our athletes who develop um, acute pericarditis, you're absolutely right. I usually used to say three to six months do not exercise, just kind of go easy. But is six months adequate? Is three months adequate? And then they ask, what exactly do you mean by um, asking me not to do too much? When is, uh, how much can I do? And that's another tough question to answer. Uh, okay, well, those are tough questions. I'm going back to Cleveland though. Um, so basically the, uh, when we see our patients, uh, we try to differentiate whether it's auto-inflammatory or autoimmune. And if you have an autoimmune patient, let's say with lupus, um, those are the more sicker patients. So unfortunately, those with lupus, rheumatoid is for life. And it's a different drug set that you give. Those are the, those are the worst ones that we have to deal with. And um, it's very interesting. Um, Somebody asked me about does rheumatology give these drugs? Basically, they, they want to see the lupus patients, but now they're referring back to cardiology because they're still getting chest pain. Can you give an I1 blocker to a lupus patient? But you can't be in two biologics you, and you're very immunosuppressed. So there's a few of lupus patients that want the biologics, you know, the ones that we give, but you have to be very careful with the uh, with the uh, the medicines. But these patients are recurring. Those MRIs last 10 years. There's still some delayed enhancement uh, over a long period of time. The radiation cases are very, very difficult. Um, often referred to surgery for surgery at Cleveland Clinic. And those have, um, Partha knows, mixed disease, mixed constriction, restriction. Uh, uh, Dr. Sengupta did some of the seminal work with um, machine learning restriction, restriction. But a lot of these uh, radiation have both. So they have maybe some tethering of the walls. Um, and you know, and maybe perhaps some thickness, but it's more a myocardial problem. So even with surgery, they're not going to do well, and very high mortality rate. But at places like Cleveland, you know, they may often do surgery. But um, so those are things to differentiate whether they have mixed disease. So uh, both those uh, patient um, uh, groups are, are difficult. Uh, with exercise, as I mentioned, the biggest fight in the office. Imagine is a you know 25, 30 year old um, um, person that uh, is, goes likes to go to the gym, and they get this recurrent pericarditis, and they sort of say, and they show them their MRI. I said this is, um, and they we wrote a um, an editorial. Exercise is good for the heart, but bad for the inflamed pericardium. I say what does that mean? Uh, I said well, I mean you sort of um, you have a dog, and someone said yeah. I said like walk your dog. Uh, that's about it. The thing uh, cool because it's well known or theoretically that the increased activity, the faster heart rate will uh, aggravate the pericardium. Uh, perhaps there's more antigens. Uh, maybe there's increased strain. Um, and we have to do formal studies. And actually, there's going to be some studies on uh, exercise and pericardias. But in general, I'm very concerned. I say, um, as long as you're in active therapy, you probably shouldn't uh, overdo it. You should, But now we're uh, getting into what stage of uh, your uh, Walking your dog, your light activity, moderate activity, um, severe activity. Um, try to limit. Uh, in the new guidelines from Europe, uh, it's going to be more shared decision making. But in general, if you have active, if you're an athlete and you have mild pericarditis, you know up to you know three to six months, you shouldn't be playing your uh, Division One sport. But try to tell that to a professional player. We had this. Uh, <clears throat> Um, I mentioned uh, in the uh, fellow conference, um, this uh, it's public knowledge, um, he was a goalie for New York Rangers. And he had surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. And um, he had pericarditis. And I told him, I said, you can't play goalie on NSAIDs. If you get hit, you're going to bleed. So we suggested that he you know, go on the biologics, but he didn't want to, so he retired. Um, so the funny story is this... Uh, Public knowledge, uh, his name is um, Lundquist. Anybody? Okay. So he came to the office uh, not that long ago with a documentary crew. 
So he did actually he put a documentary for the uh, Tribeca Film Festival, but his uh, journey is. So the, this documentary crew asked me if, uh, if I could talk to him and they're taping for the, for the documentary. So he comes into the office. So I, I figure I'm gonna have some fun, you know, what the hell, you know. Uh, I have 20 patients to see, I'm, gonna, I'm here I'm with a famous guy, a hockey player. So I said, that his name is, his nickname is Hank, right? Uh, Hank, uh, Hank, so I said, Hank, um, you know, I play in this men's league in hockey and we're short of a goalie this weekend. You, can you play for us? So Hank says to me, he said, Dr. Klein, with all due respect, he says, I don't think I'm good enough for your team. <laughs> I said, Hank, you're good enough for our team. So unfortunately, they cut it out of the documentary. It's not in the documentary. But, um, but the athletes, it's very, very difficult. Um, they want to exercise. And perhaps the biologics, you can exercise. After a year, um, that's a, a way to see whether maybe you can come off, you know, uh, pick up your activity and active exercise. But that's the biggest argument in the office. A lot of young people, they're crying and the gym is so important to them. I said, look, you've got to pick your sport and or, or try to heal. Um, so we see Olympians. We saw Division One, some professional athletes as well. Um, they're different. Yeah, you probably want to practical question. Is Um, for your patients who are... Uh, those are those are great questions. Um, so um, so what's the value of echo uh, in surveillance of some of these uh, patients? Well, uh, I think the um, the first thing when I look at an echo in active pericardias, I don't look at the echo, I look at the heart rate. I want to know that heart rate when they present. So often they, have, um, so if the heart rate is 60, uh, it's very unusual, unless they're on a beta blocker, um, to have a heart rate of 60 with active pericardia. So then you you wonder about the diagnosis. So so then you get into the two, the Doppler, the strain. So I think the uh, tissue Doppler and the strain are very good for the, um, mainly for constrictive physiology. Uh, you know, these things, um, uh, for example, tissue Doppler, you, know, you have annulus reverses, um, you have strain reverses. So I think it's very, very useful for the constrictive physiology. And then when you give the anti-inflammatories, those things reverse, they go back to normal, uh, which is very, very useful. But you have to be in good hands. In other words, meaning you have to know what you're doing, uh, adequate strain, good tracking, tissue Doppler in the right spot, the right sample volume uh, would be important things. Uh, uh, the other question was about um, for. Okay. Now the 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 um the electrophysiologists when they do VT ablations they actually uh, have a um, concoction a triamcin that they inject into the pericardial space. Uh, there are some Canadian uh, cardiologists that do that, uh, and I approached our electrophysiologist. I said this would be great business. All the pericardial you cause. Can you imagine if we we uh, we you know inject these medicines into the pericardial space, but uh, um, never seen a randomized trial. It's more anecdotes, but I tried it a couple of times when I'm tapping patients, inject steroids, but I never really found that it really helped. Uh, but it's possible. I mean, the pericardial space is a big delivery area to, to give different drugs. So in time, uh, it does make sense. As, a, as opposed to giving steroids, you get the whole the whole systemic effect. Uh, uh, local. Now the the mice models. Uh, that show that the CBD works wasn't, you know, causing a pericardial fusion and then throwing in these different drugs. So theoretically, it could work, but that you know, we're a little while off. Yes. Yes, man. Yes. You want to just put it under the microphone because there are people on the. Uh... I 
I would take it off and you know that is so why would I restrict this? To three months, um, so um, in terms of uh, a, a pericardiac event, so it depends on Sandra's experience. Um, and the third question was, you know, they should have CKD. Um, um, treatment after that, and how is the insurance? Like, uh, Okay, and those are uh, those are. I'm going back to Cleveland. These are really tough questions, but um, so the first question is with the um, with the exercise. So there's a lot of debate. I mean, the, there are guidelines for uh, participation in sports and uh, going back to activity, but in my practice, um, I find that the um, the patients that um, don't don't heed your advice that as they go to the gym um, in a um, active pericarditis. After let's say a month, uh, they'll call you on the Monday morning and says I have a, a major flare. So my practice is as long as they're on the medicines um, and you're weaning them, when they come off, they can you know, gradually pick up their activity. So I wouldn't really encourage the active exercise while they're on active therapy. But uh, in the guidelines or the previous guidelines, if the CRP falls, if you're a non-athlete, you probably could you know theoretically can go back after a month, uh, but the problem now is when you have these MRIs that are very positive and you know it takes a long time. So I'm, I'm still very conservative, you know, I, stage-wide uh, approach. Uh, wean off your medicines and then you can pick up your activity. Uh, as I mentioned, on the biologics, uh, I've encouraged people to exercise because I want to test whether they can come off. So uh, stay tuned for the European guidelines and what we say, uh, but it's going to be more a shared decision-making. Uh, if they have myocarditis, you know, obviously the uh, the Division One athletes or the professional athletes, I think you have to be careful. You may have to do some some other things. Uh, the the other uh, the last question was, uh, was about the kidney uh, patients. We wrote a uh, a one minute consult actually in Cleveland Clinic Journal, but new approaches. And I think you um, you can't take the NSA, uh, colchicine, uh, very minimal dosing. So. So it's either steroids or biologics. So I think uh, we are encouraging biologics uh, um, unless the steroids are cheaper, but yeah, steroids will take a long time to get off. So we encourage uh, biologics and we have some cases um, uh, of that approach. And the uh, the second question was what again, the middle one? It's about the surgery. Okay, so uh, we do um, basically two uh, pericardiectomies a month for not for constriction, but for the tractable recurrent pericarditis. There's only one study from Mayo uh, showing the um, that it's sort of 95% effective, but there are a few percent that still have pain after. Uh, so those are the, you know, and all of these it will be the lupus patients or the autoimmune. But I think it's a good therapy um, for people that want to be active. If you want to have a family, just say you're a uh, childbearing age and you want, to, you want to be in these meds uh, during pregnancy, I think it's a good option. And when they ask them, should we have done it sooner? They all say yes. Uh, interestingly, a good project would be to see the motion of the heart after the pericardiectomy um, to see what that does. Uh, but there are a few patients that still, I hear a year or two later, they're calling me, they got chest pain. What I do after the surgery, I look at the pathology and I say, was there active inflammation, was there neovascularization, was there um, uh, you know, a lot of neutrophils, stuff like that. And that tells me to continue some of the meds for three to six months. Because if you send somebody to surgery that's still inflamed, we don't encourage that, uh, they're gonna need some meds, anti-inflammatories for three to six months after. I wouldn't even the best chance. They went for the pericardiectomy. Um, now with surgery, um, Cleveland uh, Clinic is reporting you know, their data. So it's a very low mortality. For the idiopathic, uh, it's probably 1.1% mortality. In the literature, it's very scary if you read it, you know, it says 10%. Uh, six, uh, for radiation, that's probably true. Uh, and for uh, post cardiac injury surgery, it's probably uh, in between. But it's a low mortality for these idiopathic uh, type cases. Um, and um, I think definitely it's, a, it's an option. After a couple of years, they say, I bring it up. You've been on anakinra, now you're on it's four years already. 
uh, your your prime of your life. Do you want to uh, get? Is this your new normal, or you want to consider surgery? And um, uh, occasionally, you get the diaphragmatic uh, paralysis. You know, you hit a phrenic nerve, which you want to avoid. People do well, and uh, I think it's definitely a um, an option. And, and probably in the guidelines, they'll say it in the centers that have a lot of expertise. Perhaps this is a earlier option. And so maybe a, a mechanistic question to you. <clears throat> so I didn't get a chance to complete some of the uh, type of the studies that you were requesting, though remove the pericardium and privacy. But in an animal model, um, just out of curiosity, what would happen? I took glue and I pushed it inside the pericardium. And this is a pig model. And what was very interesting was, of course, the glue immediately starts solidifying and everything started falling. The whole, the, the animals started crashing down. Um, so obviously at the time I felt like maybe because uh, the cardiac motion is restricted. I mean, there were all kinds of hypotheses. This is published. Uh, somebody else took up the work, then Dr. Tajik and all they uh, wrote it. But I, I do not know. If, I mean, pericardium is completely unnecessary. I know that complete absence of pericardium is associated with long survival. But but there is some interventricular uh, geometries uh, that might be uh, like optimally required for a cardiac function. So I don't know if once you remove this, it, it's very intriguing. We do not know what it means to exercise tolerance, whether the RV is going to start suddenly dilating with exercise and do um, with the large venous return that will come in. Because uh, I don't know. What do you think? Right. Okay, so uh, that's uh, what Partho asked me. is very important. Patients ask, Doc, um, um, can I live without a pericardium? So the first thing I say, well, first of all, your pericardium is damaged. It's like somebody took a knife and scraped it. Got a knife and scraped it. And so you got, it's damaged. It's causing a lot of trouble. But it's true that the normal pericardium has a, you know, important functions. It prevents the dilatation of the heart has some vasomotor function. There's, you know, different uh, hormones that are secreted, uh, perhaps it prevents infection. So there is some good use. Uh, and uh, after the pericardium, um, and also congenital absence, um, somehow I get all these professional athletes. Uh, we had something like that, um, absence of pericardium, but you worry about, uh, you know, uh, protrusion or uh, strangulation of some of the structures. Um, but after the surgery, um, the heart, the motion of the heart is, um, I always tricked the fellow and said, how do you know? I said, look at that echo, tell me what happens. You can see the heart's uh, moving much more. So it's possible, uh, you know, there's different changes of venous return, or, but I never heard any clinical complaints yet um, that their, you know, their exercise tolerance is uh, decreased, but uh, definitely the motion uh, looks very, very um, um, much more mobile. Even after pericardectomy for construction, you, you do notice that. Uh, so that, that's an interesting thing. And uh, obviously, you need experienced surgeons to uh, to look at that. Uh, it's a good project. Yeah. Well, a good surgeon um, does radical pericardectomy. So there's two types of pericardectomy. Um, one would be just partial or anterior, which you may do for like window, just say you failed the window. You did the synthesis, now you're the window. Now, the next step is maybe just remove the, par the partial. But that's bad because often you come back uh, still with uh, the construction. So, so basically, it's radical, meaning that you're getting the anterior. You're basically um, avoiding the phrenic nerves. You're lifting up the heart and getting the uh, underside of the heart. So, it's now are you scraping the epicardium? You know, the, the um, so you have to be careful. You scrape too much, you're going to damage the uh, you know the myocardium. Um, so uh, it's called radical. So meaning that you're, um, you're you're getting most of it now. Even a little bit, uh, you could have you know still pain. Um, they say some of the nerve fibers are in the uh, epicardial fat layers. So you're not really getting there. But conceivably, um, you don't do when you're inflamed. So as an imager, uh, you tell your surgeon, not a good time to you know. It's very, uh, LG edema, this is bad because we had a case, uh, Tony in uh, Cleveland, um, um, our Dr. Smadera, um, actually I was at a, in Canada visiting my family and I got a call from my colleague, uh, somebody got admitted post myectomy and he had sort of constriction, you know, JVD and some partial, small effusion and 
I said, probably calm him down with anti-inflammatories, but somehow the message didn't get to the surgeon. So they took him to the OR and they tried to do a, you know, maybe a window or something. And then they converted to pericardiectomy. And it was a surgical minefield. And inadvertently, they cut the LED. So they closed them up. They aborted the surgery. And then he ended up a heart failure patient for a couple of years with all the adhesions. And the, um, they try to avoid the surgery when, when they were playing. But the, but the physiology is very interesting. You know, and also with all these procedures on the pericardium, it's very interesting what's, you know, what's going to be um, as well. So the... Um, EP guys don't like when I talk about the EP guys uh, causing a lot of work, but it's not good for stats, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Sure. Sure. Um, so you Um, so very, very important that I didn't cover genetics in, in this field. Um, um, like myocarditis, there is a, you know, genetic forms of myocarditis. Similarly, in pericarditis, um, people realize that this is auto-inflammatory disease. So they, um, there are certain genes similar to the ones that cause FMF, familial Mediterranean fever, TRAP syndrome. Uh, there's a, um, you know, so there's a gene mutations that uh, are associated with that. In UK, there's a, a physician that uh, looked at a big bank of FMF uh, patients, and they found a lot of overlap with idiopathic recurrent pericardial. So there's a gene basis for some of this. Uh, so in time, um, perhaps the, you would do a genetic analysis. I don't think we're ready for prime time for that, but I can see a panel. Uh, that we do. We did do a study and we're about to publish that about the, we collect the samples of maybe 150 patients, um, some of their bloods, and we associate it with known uh, genetic um, um, mutations. So there is definitely a, a genetics. Often the family member has lupus or rheumatoid, so we often take a family history. Uh, it's probably the milieu for, uh, you know, why would somebody have surgery and they have the big post cardiac injury syndrome? But often there's a family member. But in time, I think it will be more precision therapy. Right now, it's more precise than steroids or N-cytocotacin. So it's a targeted, but perhaps it could be gene-guided, gene-based. Uh, gene, uh, gene and, you know, we see a lot of people, you know, with overlap with the autoimmune. So definitely there's some genetic basis. Uh, this is not, not uh, well, I guess that, no, we never we never tried that, but uh, um, I guess uh, for intractable pain, it, it's always a possibility um, to, to do some type of talk. Um, or the worry would be those phrenic injury, uh, you know, in terms of nerves. Um, but uh, to eject or to uh, take out the, uh, cell, um, we, we never did, did that. But uh, people, you, you don't die from pericarditis. It's more very, very disabling. The quality of life, if you look at quality of life, it really goes down. Um, they're having constant pain. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's basically a, a pain syndrome, a lot of more mortality. Um, that's a good question about uh, to, do, to do more. Okay, uh, so the question is about COVID and the uh, and this field pericardiectomy. Um, we see a lot of patients with COVID that we don't find too much, meaning that um, you do the MRIs, you do the echoes, you do the CRPs, and they have chest pain, but you're not really finding. And then you sort of you know we sort of attribute that maybe it's lung COVID, lung COVID, or um, 
So there's no way I would, I would do a, a pericardectomy, but uh, there are uh, people, as I saw in one of my cases, I had the COVID booster and definitely got an active pericarditis. So they would be treated the same. Um, uh, the, the meds still work, if, whether you have COVID or not. Rolanocept still works, whether you have COVID, uh, whether you have the vaccine. Um, but if those patients evolve, they fail, and they, you know, then it's definitely possible that after a couple of years, I would say, you've been on these meds for a couple of years, you know, um, you got a side effect with one of these meds, consider a, consider a radical pericardiectomy. Um, the COVID, um, another quick anecdote is that um, why this field is emerging is more important. I was in at the American Heart Association, a Dr. Amazio from uh, Italy. He's a he's my counterpart in Italy. So we're in this Uber going to the uh, conference or to uh, some function. And the Uber driver says to me, hey, here we're, are you here for the cardiology convention? So we say, yeah. He says to me, he didn't know who we were. He says, is it true that the COVID vaccine causes mild pericarditis? <laughs> so I said, excuse me, sir, can you repeat that again? So he said, I said, do you know who you're talking? You're talking to the world's experts from Italy and from US. <laughs> So we know it's important because here the cabbie driver or the Uber driver is asking me what my pericarditis after the vaccine. So it got into the uh, to the mainstream. Great, fantastic. Thank you very much, Alan, for joining us. And it was a great, very informative talk. And we look forward to having you again. My pleasure. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We should take a picture. So yes, yes, we should take a picture. Yes. Well,